Good morning. Good morning. What a, a pleasant surprise indeed. We were really caught by surprise. Never. I thought such a day was ever going to come. Thank you, Keith, for, for working behind the scenes. I think your efforts are bearing fruit. Uh, thank you for encouraging these young boys. It was a surprise indeed. I was trying to find out if he, the mother was aware, she also was caught by surprise. How can you live with adults and you still surprise them? <laughs> okay, we I made a promise, or I promised last week, that uh, I just wanted to continue talking about baptism uh, because of the question that I told you about from uh, one of our visitors who has since stopped coming, uh, the, the interaction that I had with him, uh, and uh, I thought I needed to continue, like I told you last week, that I thought I needed to put this lesson of baptism into a series. The first series I consider the one that I preached from Romans chapter 6, which uh, uh, brought the questions which I then had a meeting with this guy. And then he, the, the, the second series was the one that I actually talked about last week, uh, from mainly from the book of Acts. So I want to talk about what I will call the third uh, series, which is going to be the end. At least for now, I am going to stop talking about baptism. The reason why I'm talking about all this, I think I told you that I want to try from teaching from different angles. You know, baptism is one of those subjects that I find you can easily get uh, 20, at least 20 passages that talk about baptism. If you get a subject or a, a topic like that in the Bible, with which is 20 or more passages at your disposal, to learn about such a topic. Surely that should not be a problem for us then to, to, to come to a conclusion what baptism is, who should be baptized, how is it done, whether it's... Our question when I'm doing this series is to try and answer the question whether baptism was mandatory. I actually told you that uh, this friend of mine was saying, or this visit of ours actually was categorically saying baptism has nothing to do with salvation. Baptism is an option of the person who has been taught if he wants or if she wants to be baptized, that's it. It's a good idea. But if they don't want to be baptized, baptized they can still be saved if they have not been baptized. So that's, that, that's the myth we are actually trying to dispel because the, the Bible is so clear about baptism, whether it is mandatory or whether it is not. I think we saw some of the passages last week, particularly from the book of Acts. We used at least eight examples uh, from the book of Acts last week, which all were pointing to the fact that uh, there is no but who ever became a Christian in the Bible, even those that are recorded for us, who was not baptized. If it was really an option, I believe one of them would have said, yeah, okay, I'm going to receive Christ as this friend of ours was saying, but I don't want to be baptized. We don't see any of that ever happening in the Bible. So I just want us to bring this uh, subject to a close with this series number three, uh, that we are going to be uh, talking about this morning. So uh, I have entitled this uh, presentation Bapt Baptism Washing Away Seeds. And I want us to look at uh, a couple of passages in the Bible which are talking about baptism as uh, allowing us to wash away our seeds. Our first passage that I want us to look at this morning is Titus chapter 3. And we are going to read from verse 4. I only have four passages or four books that we are going to read from. The first already is Titus. We are also going to read, to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We are also going to read from Ephesians chapter 5. And we are going to finally end in the book of 1 Peter. So if we start in the book of Titus, uh, there are a couple of things that I want us to see in this passage. In fact, this is just one of those passages, few of them, that actually tell us or bring out to the fore what we have always called the Godhead. The Godhead that comprises God the Father, 
God the Son and God the Spirit. We are not going to see how Titus is going to give each and every one of them, the three of them, uh, their task in us uh, being served when we are uh, becoming uh, Christians. If we go to the book of Titus chapter 3, beginning from verse 1, Titus is actually writing, we believe he is still in Crete. You remember uh, the very first passages or the very first verses of this uh, in verse 5 in particular, Paul actually tells us that uh, he left uh, uh, Titus in Crete so that he would put such things which were in disorder to be in order. And the main reason why he had been left in Crete was to appoint elders. So he's going to be told about the qualifications of the elders. That's uh, really what we, 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 we see in chapter 1. Then in chapter 2, he is going to tell him and encourage him to teach a sound doctrine always. Titus was one of those young preachers during Paul, one of them being Silas, the other being Timothy. And we are seeing Timothy and Silas, I mean Timothy and Titus receiving letters from uh, the big brother, Paul. So in chapter 3, he is going to remind Titus to remind those that he was teaching, remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities. He was talking about civil government here. So remind those Christians to be submissive to rulers and authorities to be obedient, to be ready for every good way, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. For we ourselves, in verse 3, were once foolish, disobedient, we were led astray, we were slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating, other, and hating, hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness, this is where Paul is now going to build up to what I want us to talk about. But, so he has talked about what they were and what most of us were before. What is it that we were? We were foolish. That's what he says in verse 3. For we ourselves were once foolish. We were disobedient, obviously, to God. We were led astray. Obviously led astray by wild teachings. We were slaves to various passions and, we, and, and various pleasures. Passing our days in malice and envy, we were hated by others and we were also hating one another. But, he says in verse 4, when the goodness of love and kindness of God, our Savior, who is God the Father in this particular context, but when the goodness and love and kindness of God the Father, I'm putting the Father there so that you will see the Godhead that I'm talking about in this passage. The kindness of God our Savior appeared. He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, God the Spirit is mentioned there, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, who is God the Son, so the God yet is actually uh, out there for us to see. He has talked about the, the role of God the Father. He has also talked about the role of God the Spirit. He is now in chapter verse 6 talking about the role of uh, God the Son, our Savior. Verse 7, so that being justified by His grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Let us go back to uh, verse 4. Titus tells them, or, I mean, Titus has been told by Paul that before all of us, including Paul himself, we know his history. He says we were wild, we were living wicked, we, we did not obey God's commands. But then when he comes to verse 4, he says, But when the goodness and loving kindness of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us. So Paul is actually making an acknowledgement to the fact that every Christian is saved. Or we are being saved, as the book of uh, Acts would actually say. He would actually say, those that are being saved. So, because if we are going to say we are saved, there, there are so many people that actually would then tell you that, uh, so why do we continue worshipping God if we are already saved? In fact, that is actually used by so many people who tell you that once somebody is saved, he cannot fall from grace. There is no uh, falling from grace. So once you are saved, you are saved. So if we are going to take this according to those lines of the thinking of those people, then it means that once you are saved, you are 
you, you, you are saved. You cannot fall from grace. Even if you decide not to worship God, you are going to still be saved because you have already been saved, which is not what Paul is saying here. Paul, what he's saying here is, we are saved. But how are we saved? Listen to what he says while we are still there in verse 4. I mean, while when we jump into verse 5, he saved us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness. So we are not saved by anything that we can do ourselves. Neither are we saved by anything that we can do for ourselves. But we are still saved. How does that happen? He continues right there in verse 5. But according to his, according to God the Father, his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. If you go back to, 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 to that statement, by the washing uh, of regeneration, Paul is making mention, because if we read this together with all the other passages that Paul has ever taught, including Romans chapter 6, which gave us this question that we are trying to answer now from that man, where Paul said in Romans chapter 6, when we are baptized, we are baptized into the death of Jesus, such that when Jesus was raised from the dead, we are also raised to they be joined with you, and we are now a new creation that is walking with you. If you come here, Paul is saying, before we can go into, in, into the Lord, we are saved. But how are we saved? We are saved by the washing, and this the purpose of this washing, which Paul is talking about here, is so that it can regenerate or renew the Holy Spirit that is in us. So if, if, if this washing that he is talking about evidently refers to baptism, if somebody then is going to say baptism is optional, how then are you going to revitalize or to regenerate or to renew the Holy Spirit that Paul says it is supposed to be renewed in you? When you are being saved, you have to renew. So what Paul basically is saying is there is God. God is going to have a certain uh, task that he's going to play in you for, for, to receive salvation. So God, because of his kindness and his mercy, he is going to save you. But you are only going to be saved if you are washed. In. And that washing is going to regenerate the Holy Spirit that is in you. Then, in verse 6 he says, Whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus our Savior. So God the Father is a task that he is playing. The God, the, the Spirit also has to be revived that is in you, which actually came to us through the Son, Jesus Christ. Paul is talking here about baptism, which essentially is a sign or an emblem that actually affects our outward. But Paul does not, is not worried really much about our outward. This we are doing because he says, oh, we, we, are, we are showing our obedience to, to the instructions that God gave us. But baptism is just a sign or an emblem that is affecting the outward. The Holy Spirit then is going to be manifested in the lives of those who live godly lives. So we are going to go through the washing that Paul is talking about, which evidently is baptism. After that, we are then going to regenerate or to renew or to revitalize the Holy Spirit that must be in us. Then our lives from then on, Paul says in Galatians chapter 2 verse 20, it's no longer I who lives, I died with Christ. When did he die with Christ? When he was baptized, he was actually dying to sin. So he died with Christ. And it's, Paul says in Galatians chapter 2 verse 20, I died with Christ. And it's no longer I, Paul, who is living today, but Christ is actually living in me. How was Christ living in Paul? If you saw Paul walking, you could actually see Christ walking. How? Because the Holy Spirit that was in Paul was now being manifested in his life. And the Holy Spirit that is in you, in me today, can only be manifested in the lives of those who live God's life. If you see somebody stealing somebody's as, as, as property, you, you can conclude that this person does not have the Holy Spirit that is being manifested in him. Because the Holy Spirit is not manifested in doing odd and bad things. It has to be manifested if we are living a good and a godly life. So we have to be washed in, because that, wa that washing is going to regenerate or to renew the Holy Spirit that is in us. Then when we start walking and living according to uh, the requirements of the Holy Spirit, then that Holy Spirit is then going to be manifested in our lives. We are also justified by grace to be heirs. We are going to talk about this word justification 
a little bit later. I just want to take note of that. That's why I have underlined it because I'm going to combine that passage with another passage. Then we try to understand what Paul is actually talking about. But from this passage, what I wanted you to take note of is uh, Paul is talking about baptism, which is going to regenerate uh, the, the Holy Spirit that is in us. And it's not only going to be manifested in those, in the lives of those who live uh, according to what God requires. So, in conclusion, from this passage, baptism is washing that regenerates and renews the Holy Spirit which is in us. Let's move on to another passage, which is my next passage, which is 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11. We are going to combine the, the, the four passages and then see whether baptism is an option or it's something that was compulsory in the early church. Not today. In chapter 6, the Apostle Paul is writing again and he's writing to Christians that were at court. He, he says a lot of things in, in, from chapter 1 and he's talking about so many things the same way that he was saying uh, to Titus in chapter 3 about how other people are going to live uh, wickedly before they become Christians. So he's going to mention a couple of things there uh, of the things that they were doing. Then in verse 9 he says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do, do not be deceived. Neither the sexual immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greed, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Then listen to what he says in verse 11. And such were some of you. In Titus, we remember, he says, some of us were living like this, living like exactly what he has mentioned above. But we changed our lives. We turned around our lives. And we are now living like this. So he's saying again the same thing to the Corinthians here. And such were some of you who were living like drunkards, who were living like thieves, who were living like idolaters, who were living like homosexuals, who were living like any other wicked practice on earth. Some of you were like this. But you were washed. How were they washed? You were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Paul is going to mention three things there that actually happened to them. You were washed. Then after you had been washed, you were sanctified. And after you were sanctified, that's exactly what he's saying there. After you were sanctified, you were then justified in the name of of the Lord Jesus. If, if Paul is talking about baptism in this particular chapter that you were baptized, what that means then is if somebody is not baptized, then they cannot be sanctified. What, what exactly is sanctification? Uh, if we go to uh, there, we were washed. Number two, we were sanctified, which means basically to be set apart or to be set aside or to be reconciled or to be made one. Listen to what Paul is saying here. Paul has been talking about almost every evil practice on earth. And he's saying there are people who are actually living like that. But if you decide when you are one of such people who are living according to the world, if you decide, the very point that you decide, I no longer want to live like this. I want to live like this. The moment that you decide to do that, you have to be washed. Then when you have been washed, you are then going to be sanctified. You are then going to be set apart. You are going to be set aside. You are going to be reconciled with the Lord. You are going to be made worthy. You were unworthy. You were wicked. But now you are actually being taken out of the group of wicked people. You are now an old one out who has been set apart. That only happens after you have been washed. So that when you are sanctified, you are then going to be justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Justified by faith in Christ. That's what he says in Galatians chapter 2, verse 16. We have already seen, he has talked, in, in Titus he has talked about justified. He is talking about being justified here. He says we are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in Galatians chapter 2, verse 16, he says we are justified by faith in Christ. In all the occasions, Christ has to be there when we are being justified. I, I thought about being justified. And the simplest way that I could understand what Paul was saying was this. Uh, you know, I have this computer that is in front of me. And to all of you who are, are familiar with computers, when you are writing a document on the computer, the computer actually gives you some options. Four of them, I think. It actually gives you an option to align your document from the left. So if you want it, like in this particular case, you can actually see that my document starts from the same point. 
but it doesn't end on the same point here. That's on the computer call is called aligning to the left. But you could also choose to align to the right, where your documents actually don't end on the same spot, but it can actually start anyhow. It also gives you an option where line number one it starts from there and it ends there. Line number two is going to start from here and it ends there. You, you are not justifying by, uh, I mean, you are just trying to align one side to the left or you are aligning to the right. Then the last option that it gives you is called to justify. That is the computer. It actually has that icon for justifying. Justifying is actually going to give you a, 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 a neat and a smart way because your document is going to be aligned to the left. Your document is going to be aligned to the right. You, you, whatever statement you are, you, are, you are typing, your computer is going to know that if this word is not going to be able to fit on the space that is left, it's actually going to take it to the next sentence. However, all the words that are in that sentence are actually going to be spread in such a way that they are going to be aligned here, they are also going to be aligned here, so you, have, you also have an alignment here and you have an alignment here. That is called justification when you are talking about computers. If you think about that way, and we, 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 we think about the way that I've already been talking about, which is to align. When you are aligning something, you have taken your cars before uh, to the suspension people, and you are saying your alignment is out. If your alignment is out, either your, your, your car is going to be uh, eating inside or outside your wheels. Either your car cannot go straight, you have to be fighting with everything to fight with it every time. So you have to go to the alignment shop for it to be aligned so that it's going to go straight. So what we are simply doing is we are putting that which was in disorder, we are putting it in order. So Paul is actually talking about being justified in Christ. What he is simply talking about is us being aligned. But how are we aligned? In First Corinthians he says we are aligned in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then here in Galatians he says, we are aligned by faith. And where is our faith? Our faith is supposed to be in Christ. So if we don't have Christ in our life, we cannot be aligned. We, we have nothing that can align us to him. We have to be in him first so that we can be aligned. But how do we come into him? By being washed so that we are sanctified and then we can be aligned in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. What, what is this washing that Paul is talking about? Except that he is definitely talking about baptism. We are supposed to be baptized. When we are, when we are baptized, we are then sanctified. And then we are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's, let's try the next passage and see what Paul again says in the book of Ephesians. If we turn our Bible to the book of Ephesians chapter 5. Let's turn our Bible to the book of Ephesians chapter 5. You know, in Ephesians chapter 5, starting from verse 22, Paul is actually talking about the family setup. And he's talking about the father, he's talking about the mother, who is the, the wife and the husband, and he's going to talk about children. And he also is going to talk about to those of you that you have, uh, he calls them slaves, or that you have workers in your home. He also talks, so he's talking about the complete home setup where there is a father, there is a mother, there are children, and there is a worker. So, from verse 22, he's, take, he's giving instructions to what the wife is supposed to do in the family. We are not worried about that. I want to jump to verse 25, because there is something that I want us to see there from verse 25. Now the instruction is being directed to the husband. And he says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. And he gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her. So the reason why Jesus gave up his life for the church was because he wanted the church to be sanctified. But how is it going to be sanctified? He says, he had been cleansed the head by the washing of water with the word. So the washing that Paul has been talking about in Titus, the washing that he's talking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, is the washing of water which is now mentioned in the book of Ephesians. Let, let us understand this. Paul always had the uh, he had care for the church. He always had care for the Christians. He had always yet because when, when we turn to the book of Acts chapter 20, in verse 28, I believe it is, Paul is actually in Militus and he is talking to the Ephesians elders that he had called to come down from Ephesus to come to meet him up in Militus. 
while he is talking to these elders, he reminded them that it's the Holy Spirit that made you elders or overseers over these people. Then he says to them, therefore take care of the church of the Lord. Why were they supposed to take care of the church of the Lord? Because Paul is saying the church of the Lord is important because it was purchased or it was bought by his own blood. Or it was bought with the price that was paid for the church to be in existence is the blood of Christ, is the blood of Jesus. You, you could not have paid any amount that can surpass the blood of Christ. So Paul here in, in, in Ephesians, he is saying he gave up his life for the church. In verse 26, that he might sanctify it. So the death that happened to, to Christ was so that the church can be set apart. The church can be set aside. The church can be made holy. How is it going to be made holy? That he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. So we are going to see again the water coming into a Christian's life. That is the first part of call. That is the conduct that we have to have. Washing of water with the word, which is also going to be involved. So that the church is, is, is going to have no spot or no wrinkle on it. It's going to be clean, it's going to be holy, but be holy and blameless without any, any blemish. So, what Peter then is going to tell us in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21, is that baptism saves us. So, if we turn there quickly to the book of Peter, we want 1 Peter chapter 3. Peter is going to say in chapter 3 of the book of Peter, Reading from verse 21, the book of 1 Peter, chapter 3, reading from verse 21. In that passage, Paul has been talking in the preceding verses, he has been talking about Noah. So in verse 18, he says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formally did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah. He reminds us of the time of Noah. So he actually is telling us that God had patience during that, the, the time of Noah. He waited during the time of Noah uh, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. So he's talking about the incident of Noah, but listen to how he tells the, the, the discourse or the, the, the conversation in verse 21. Baptism, which corresponds to this. So baptism, our baptism, the baptism of a Christian today, corresponds to the situation of Noah. How does it correspond? He says baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of death from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If we had to take Peter according to his word, when he says baptism, which corresponds to whatever happened to Noah, now serves us. If we are going then to go out and teach that baptism is an option, how is this person that is going to decide not to be baptized, how is he going to be saved? Yet here, Peter is actually saying it is the baptism that is saving us. Of course, if we try to explain what Peter was saying, there is no saving power in the water. That water does not have any saving power, but the power is in the blood of Christ. The blood of Christ that we are going to come in contact with when we are baptized. We have no other uh, symbolic way or any other uh, way of getting in contact with the blood of Christ unless we have gone through the waters of the baptism. The water itself is not going to save us. I, I remember last week, I think I mentioned the fact that uh, when somebody is baptized, there is nothing really physical that we are going to see in the water. We are not going to see your sins floating on the water to say, oh look, he actually, this guy is serving sins. We can actually recover all of them in the water. We are not going to see anything like that except somebody just getting wet. But Peter also is complimenting what Paul has already talked about. That when we are baptized, there is no saving power in the water, but the saving power lies in the blood of Christ. Noah was delivered from a wicked world by water. We all know the story of Noah. The same water that is delivering Noah, taking his act up, saving his life, is the same water that actually is going to drown everybody and everything else, to kill everybody, for God to then regenerate the world through Noah's blood. So the same water that is going to save Noah is the same water that God used to condemn. I've, I've, I've always likened that to the word of God today. This very word, 
That is actually going to see others going into the into the eternal life and live with him in his kingdom. It's the very way that also is going to condemn others. Some people are going to go to hell because of the same way, which actually is going to bring salvation and joy to some. So the same way, depending from which angle or which side are you approaching it from, is either going to give you salvation or is going to condemn you. That's what we see with the water during Noah's time. If Noah was delivered from a wicked world by water, Peter's readers, you and me included, are delivered from their own sin by the blood of Jesus through immersion in water. Because that's where we are going to get in contact with the, water, the, the blood of Jesus. The first point is one cannot expect God then to fulfill the promise of remission if you will not submit to conditions of remission. Peter, on the, on the day of Pentecost, when he has been asked questions about, about what people should do to be saved, Peter is going to say, repent and be baptized, every one of you. That's in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of your sins or for the remission of your sins. So the condition for the remission of sins is that we are baptized in water. So we cannot expect God to come and act on his part if we have not acted on our part. God's part is to ask us to be, to, to, to be baptized. Then whatever is going to happen after baptism, that's God's business. It has nothing to do with us. But if we refuse to, 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 to obey the command of being baptized, we can then not expect God to fulfill his part. He cannot fulfill his promise of remission of sin if we don't submit to conditions of remission. Baptism, from what we have been looking at these past three weeks, it's, it's difficult to actually say baptism is not required. It's easier actually to rather say we may not understand every detail about how baptism is going to put us into Christ, how baptism is going to, 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 to have your sins forgiven, how we, we may not know everything. That's really God's business. But I think you are actually putting yourself in a very hard corner, a very difficult corner to come out of. If you are going to claim that baptism is an option, it's not optional. I mean, it's not, it's not compulsory because every other example that we can look about or we can look for in the Bible about baptism, it was always a command. It was always a command. And surely a command is not an option. A command is compulsory. Either we take the command and we are then going to be on the way for salvation or we refuse to take the command. I find baptism, even from these four passages that we, we have read, which are continuously talking about washing, the washing that regenerates, the washing that puts us in Christ, the washing that is going to make us new creations, the washing, that washing that Peter is talking about, that Paul talked about, is the washing that is happening in baptism. Somebody has to be baptized so that you can be on course. And let me end by saying we can only be in, on course to receive salvation if we have been baptized into Christ. There's no two ways about this. Either we believe that or we don't. But the good thing is with the word of God is we cannot change it. Neither can we can, can our actions change what, what, what the word of God is saying. What God is saying is now there. It's either me to feel or then to go and follow what it says or I reject that. Like I said last week that everybody uh, is, a, is an opportunity. Everybody deserves the opportunity to either accept or to re reject the gospel. The gospel will, re will remain the gospel. Baptism, for now, as I am ending this argument, baptism is and shall always be compulsory to anybody who wants to be in Christ. Anybody who doesn't want to be in Christ, then they are the ones who may suggest that baptism was an option. I just hope and trust that uh, this actually is going to help us going forward. And this is also going to help those that have not, I will always talk about them, that have not yet decided to be baptized for reasons better known to them. Uh, we, 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 we cannot force anybody to be baptized. But we can always encourage from the scriptures that we need baptism and we need it now. It's actually an urgent matter that has to be attended to now. That is, if you also are harboring thoughts of ever living with Christ uh, when he comes back. We are all supposed to be on that road. But baptism, like I've already said, it doesn't save our sins. It's our actions after baptism. In fact, what saves our sins is the blood of Christ. But when we have been put into his blood, 
we now need to live faithfully so that the Holy Spirit is going to be manifested in us. The works of the Holy Spirit are going to be seen in us, in our actions, in the things that we do, in how we speak, how we eat, how we conduct our business. Then Christ is actually going to be seen in what we do, living faithfully after baptism. Baptism is the first part of all, but it has to be accompanied by many, many other things in our lives after we have been baptized. Kids, last week talked about uh, this idea of people then talking about it. Uh, when, when, when we think about Acts chapter 10, for example, uh, in, I mean, uh, during Cornelius' time, the Bible is going to say uh, Cornelius together with his household were baptized. And many, many people are actually going to hinge on that verse and say, so that also means we can even uh, uh, baptize babies. Because Paul's household, we are not told how many people were not baptized and how many people were baptized. It would appear that everybody was baptized. I think that can always be attended to in relation to other passages which, which talk, talk about baptism. You remember the other time I promised that I was going to talk about the five W's, what I call five W's in baptism. Who should be baptized? What is baptized? What is baptism? When is baptism supposed to occur? Uh, how is it supposed to be done and who is supposed to be baptized? I was going to talk about those five things, five W's and one edge. I'm not going to do that now because surely we have many, many other subjects to preach on. We will leave subject to rest for now, this subject of baptism to rest now, and we will always talk about it some other time in the future if need arises. But for now, I will conclude by saying I took note of what Keith said last week, of which my answer still is. The Bible is always shown from the examples that we have that it was not for infants because it is for those that have been taught. We looked at uh, Mark chapter 16 the other time where Jesus was saying those that are going to believe and are going to be saved, they are the, those that are going to believe and are baptized, they are the ones that are going to be saved. That surely should ex exclude uh, small boys like them because you can't teach them, they can't believe neither can they be baptized then because baptism is for those who are sinful not for those who are sinless thank you very much for your patience and your time I hope and trust this can help us uh, as always uh, going, going into the future thank you